After Jackson takes over the presidency in March 1829, he's going to begin changing the fundamental role of the president in American politics. He's going to add power to the presidency, and he's going to do things that previous presidents had been hesitant to do because they don't think it's the place of the president to do these things. Uh, and Jackson's going to go further than previous presidents in a number of ways. So he's going to change the presidency, make it more powerful uh, the second he gets into office. How does he do this? Well, perhaps the very first example you can tell of him acting differently than previous presidents is how he's going to fill out his cabinet. So the president has people working for him. As executive, you've got to carry out the functions of Congress, collect taxes, this type of thing. You need to hire offices as commander-in-chief. You need to appoint officers, that type of thing. So you need people to help you. Well, previous presidents had put allies into the cabinet, had put friends into certain political positions, but they mainly put people that were qualified and a lot of times they left even political opponents in their positions as long as they didn't interfere with their um, administration. So uh, as we talked about with Thomas Jefferson, he had replaced some higher ups in uh, John Adams administration, but he'd kept military officers who might be federalists. He'd replaced, again, some federalists, but uh, higher ups, but he'd kept um, federalists in lower positions. Well, what we're going to see Jackson do is he's going to fill his cabinet and he's going to fill these federal offices that are under the president, not necessarily with qualified people, but instead those supporters who had helped him get into the presidency and those who are loyal to him, even if they might not be qualified the job for the job he was appointing them to do. So what Jackson is going to do is be the first to employ something called the spoil system. Uh, what I say, what I mean when I say spoil system is uh, Jackson will basically say to the victor go the spoils. So whoever wins gets to do what they want. So what Jackson's going to do is he's going to, I shouldn't say completely clear out all the positions that the executive branch can appoint. But he will uh, eliminate a, a, a number of people that are qualified who might have spoken poorly about him uh, over the previous years. So obviously this means the cabinet that John Quincy Adams had had is gone. Of course, Henry Clay is no longer going to be uh, Secretary of State. And that's to be expected. You know, the president doesn't want political opponents being his right-hand men. But Jackson's going to go beyond that. He's going to start firing uh, uh, military officers that opposed him. He's going to start firing duty collectors that opposed him, tax collectors that opposed him, anyone who uh, didn't go along with him when he had uh, uh, when he was running for the presidency. And he's going to put in place people that he trusts, even if they're not qualified. So we're going to give a couple uh, examples of this. Uh, one person that is going to be at least initially as close confidant as John C. Calhoun. I wouldn't qualify him as part of the spoil system because uh, uh, he was a elected vice president, but he'll be close confidant of uh, Jackson, and he's going to make him part of what he's going to call his kitchen cabinet. And this is going to be a group of close advisors, generally, uh, you know, the cabinet members, Secretary of the State, Secretary of Treasury, Secretary of War, Attorney General, and he's going to be inviting Calhoun to meet with him. So I wouldn't count Calhoun as part of the spoil system. Uh, but one person I would is a guy that uh, uh, Andrew Jackson is going to appoint as Secretary of State, and that's going to be Martin Van Buren. Now, Martin Van Buren is an incredibly intelligent person, and he had served in some overseas diplomatic roles, but he didn't have a lot. He didn't have experience compared to others uh, that Jackson might have appointed. Uh, but Jackson trusts Van Buren more than he would somebody else. So he wants him to be a secretary of state. So you help me get elected to the presidency. I consider you a friend. I'd rather have a friend in this office uh, than somebody who might be a little bit more qualified. Um, and what we're going to actually see is Martin Van Buren and John C. Calhoun are going to be in these two positions in, in Jackson's meetings. They're both going to be vying for his attention because uh, both see uh, their position, Calhoun as vice president, Van Buren as secretary of state, as sort of a lead up to whoever becomes uh, the next uh, president. So 
Calhoun and uh, Martin Van Buren, people that supported Jackson, Jackson's going to make sure they're members of his cabinet, uh, invited all meetings, and he's going to put uh, Van Buren in position of power. Now, again, I don't know if I would say that would be uh, necessarily an example of spoil system, just because, you know, while not as qualified as uh, others might be, Van Buren is a smart person. The person that Jackson's going to appoint his Secretary of War is going to be a childhood buddy named John Eaton. So the thing with John Eaton is that he had served in the military as a young man. He had some military experience, which a Secretary of War probably should have, but he didn't have a lot of high-level military experience. He'd never been a general. He'd never, uh, uh, he hadn't served in multiple wars. He hadn't been a, uh, involved in the strategies of war. The main qualifications that he has for Secretary of War are going to be that he had fought, he'd been a soldier, and that he was Jackson's buddy. So Jackson will appoint John Eaton not because of his qualifications, but because uh, he, he's his friend. And this is going to go for a number of other positions in, in Jackson's administration. Um, now, he's going to go uh, further than Thomas Jefferson had gone when getting rid of the Federalists when he took over, uh, and certainly further than um, the Republicans, we know when they're taking over from fellow Republicans. So to the victory go the spoils, let's get rid of the people that oppose me and let's fill these federal positions with my friends. Now, you'll later see this uh, politicians applying this spoil system to get people into office that will help them financially or, you know, um, going to give them money or, you know, uh, will later support them politically. Jackson's not going to be using the spoil system to that effect. He basically thinks that this is democratic to do this way. So the people trust me, and I trust people like John Eaton. They might not be the most qualified, but they're going to work close with me. So basically, this is the will of the people. He sees this spoil system as being a, a result of democracy. So when you think of Jackson, think of him as... Uh, firing people that might be qualified and appointing people that he trusts uh, uh, as, as members of his cabinet in higher positions in the federal government. Uh, another thing that Jackson's going to do more than any previous president, um, oh, here's a picture of uh, Jackson basically uh, doling out positions uh, um, in, in government. Another thing that Jackson's going to do is, prior to more than previous presidents is he's going to basically undermine the legislature uh, and he's going to push for passages of certain bills by speaking directly to the people, okay? The way the founders had assembled the Constitution, the legislature would write laws, the president's going to approve them, and then the president will carry them out. Well, Jackson, what he's going to do a lot of times is if he sees the legislature isn't creating a bill, passing a law, uh, that he wants passed or if the legislature's not taking action that he thinks uh, it should take, what Jackson will do is he's going to go to newspapers, he's going to go to reporters, and he's going to tell the American people, you guys love me, tell your representatives to get off their ass and do something. Now, previously, the presidents, hypothetically, they could have done this, but because we didn't have this expansive democracy where everybody can vote, you're not necessarily going to be able to vote uh, your House of Representative member out of office. But now you can because of this expanded voting. So if Jackson says to the people, your House of Representative member isn't approving this bill that I like, tell him to. That's a real threat to the House of Representative member because if he doesn't do what Jackson wants and Jackson has this sway with the people, next two years when the, his House of Representative position is up, he could be out of there because Jackson... Uh, uh, disliked him and told the people to vote him out. So Jackson's going to start taking issues directly to people way more than previous presidents. Uh, he's even going to get to the point where he's basically going to hire a newspaper to deliver his messages. Now, it's going to be an unofficial organ of the presidency, but it's going to be as close to official as you can get. Uh, Jackson's basically going to call up this newspaper editor, this guy Francis Preston Blair, uh, to Washington, and he's going to tell Blair, I've got a job for you. I want you to create this newspaper. The uh, newspaper's going to end up being called the Washington Globe, and he's going to tell Blair, you know, meet with him on occasion and basically say, I want you to make this a headline of the newspaper. Jackson says this bill needs to be passed. 
or Jackson says this congressman isn't doing their job. And what Blair will do is basically print, say, what the president once uh, said, okay? Now, we think of today, we got networks that are saying what the president wants or networks saying what uh, one branch of uh, party wants, uh, and then this other network says what the other branch wants. That's always been around to some extent, but you never had this close cooperation until this point. Again, you know, you had your Federalist newspapers and Republican newspapers, and they were sort of helping out the candidates, but this is Jackson directly feeding news uh, to this Washington Globe. Now, Blair uh, will keep the Washington Globe uh, in um, uh, printing out what Jackson says throughout his first administration. And so Jackson, again, can sort of bend the legislature to his will, because if you don't do what I want, then uh, I'm going to tell Blair to tell the people to uh, vote you out. Again, sort of bending democracy to do what he wants. Uh, Jackson is also going to go further than previous presidents with the veto, okay? So per the Constitution, presidents have the power to veto any bills that go through both houses of Congress. So House of Representatives and Senate approve a bill or approve a tax code or approve a new duty, approve a new tax or whatever. And when it gets to the president's desk, the president can veto the bill. And then it, it, once he vetoes, it would take uh, two thirds of the legislature to override this veto. Well, previous presidents or presidents prior to Jackson had used that veto only when they believed that the bill arriving on their desk was unconstitutional. And this is the way the founders had interpreted that veto. They saw the president as an interpreter of the Constitution. Now, as we talked about before, the Supreme Co Court has taken uh, the role as interpreter of the Constitution, even though that wasn't originally how it was intended. But uh, the president was meant to also be an interpreter of the Constitution. So what we'd seen prior to Jackson is a lot of presidents getting bills on their desk that they didn't like, but they agreed were constitutional, and they signed them into law because, you know, they, the presidents aren't supposed to be a part of the legislative process. We're just supposed to determine if the Constitution allows us to do this. And we'd also seen presidents veto bills they liked um, uh, because they, uh, uh, they thought they were unconstitutional. You can even go back to James Monroe. Uh, there was a, a bill for creating infrastructure in the United States. Monroe thought, man, it'd be great if the national government could build roads. And he wanted to sign it, but he thought the Constitution didn't allow the national government to build roads, so he had vetoed it. So the, it was meant to be a determinant of constitutionality. That's not what Jackson's going to do. And by the way, that's not what we do today. If you uh, go to a president today, they veto when they don't like it. They aren't determiners of constitutionality anymore, and that's because of Andrew Jackson. What Andrew Jackson will do consistently is he's going to veto bills he doesn't like, and he's going to approve bills he does like. Forget constitutionality. He's going to basically throw away that role of the president, and he's just going to make the veto as a, a means of basically stepping into the legislative process. Forget what the Founding Fathers said. I'm going to veto what I don't like, and I'm going to uh, approve things I do like. Now, I'm going to give you an example. So Jackson hadn't really stepped into the infrastructure, whether in, uh, national government creating infrastructure is constitutional or not, but he's kind of going to be forced to do this because in his first term, Henry Clay will bring a bill to his desk that would ask the federal government to build a road through Kentucky uh, out to the West. So the, we've had this huge expansion of the United States. The West is still very unpopulated because it's hard to get out there because there's not a, a lot of roads. Well, Henry Clay proposes that the national government use funds coming in from duties uh, to build a road, and uh, that way we can expand uh, the population of the United States westward. Well, Jackson... Again, he doesn't have any opinion on whether uh, that's constitutional or not. But when this bill gets to his desk, a lot of ways he might want to improve it because Jackson's from west of the Appalachian Mountains. This bill would certainly help Tennessee, um, his home state. But he looks at the bill, and he sees that it's written by Henry Clay, and he sees it would help Henry Clay's state of Kentucky. Again, remember, Jackson doesn't like Clay because uh, bargain and corruption, 1824, 1825, uh, and then doesn't like Clay because supposedly what uh, uh, he and John Quincy Adams had said about his wife. So when the bill gets to his desk, Jackson vetoes it. 
not because he thinks it's unconstitutional, not because he doesn't like it, but he vetoes it because he doesn't like Henry Clay. So he's going to do this with more bills combined, or more bills than all previous presidents combined. So previous presidents had rarely used the veto, and they'd only used it when they thought something was unconstitutional. Jackson just starts vetoing everything because he sees himself as being a part of the legislative process. I want to determine uh, you know, what bills should be passed. Forget this constitutionality argument. I'm going to veto things I don't like. Again, uh, we do that the way that Jackson did it today. That's not how it was intended to, do to be done. Uh, this veto of Henry Clay's, uh, uh, it's called the uh, uh, May Mayfield Road uh, that he wants to be built, that also sort of signifies another part of uh, the way that Jackson's going to influence the presidency. More than any president before, Jackson is going to use personal biases to influence his decision making. Now, everybody makes decisions on personal biases. You know, obviously George Washington had done it, John Adams, John Quincy Adams, all previous presidents have certain decisions they're going to make, you know, based on the neurons in their brains, past experiences, that type of stuff. But most presidents take into account the law and, you know, uh, prior, you know, uh, prior rulings, things like that, uh, what previous people have done. Jackson's not going to do that. He's going to make a lot of decisions based on gut feeling. Uh, not what people have done before, not what he thinks is legally right, but what he personally thinks is right. Uh, and we're going to see this, uh, for example, in something called uh, when the renewal for the National Bank is going to come up in 1830. So the National Bank, we talked about it before, initially founded by Alexander Hamilton. It had expired. Uh, this had created a lot of problems. It was renewed in 1816, and the U.S. government was putting its money in this National Bank until 1836. Well, it's getting close to renewal. Actually, Henry Clay is going to introduce this bank renewal early because he wants Jackson to make a decision on it. And uh, just like this uh, Mayfield Road veto, Henry Clay is going to pass this bill and say, we want to renew the National Bank for 20 years. And Henry Clay, again, believes in his, uh, part of his American system. We like the National Bank. We like infrastructure. Well, Jackson's going to get this renewal for the bank. Again, Jackson hasn't made any personal opinions on the bank. But basically, he looks at it. He looks at Henry Clay. And just like Henry Clay's uh, infrastructure bill, Jackson's going to say, screw you, Henry Clay. And he's going to veto it. He's going to veto the renewal of the National Bank. And again, this is m less on whether he thinks the National Bank's good for the United States and more on I hate Henry Clay. Now, this one is somewhat humorous in that, although we are going to see some negative consequences, and we'll talk about more about those later, but sometimes these gut feelings are going to have really... Uh, gross outcomes and are, are going to uh, n uh, negatively Im impact the United States in ways that we sort of uh, uh, still have to deal with today. And in particular, this is going to be Jackson's treatment towards these problems between the Indians in the southeast of the United States uh, and the state of Georgia. So we've talked uh, since the beginning about the various Indian groups in um east of the Mississippi. So we talked about these Northwest Indians, these uh, groups are sort of, uh, uh, some are hunter-gatherers, uh, some are sedentary agriculturalists, but these very dispersed tribes eventually going to come under uh, Tecumseh, work together. But by this point, when Jackson enters office, these guys had been pushed west, and we talked about pre prior to that, you know, um, Indian groups have been pushed west uh, uh, you know, by the English and then, you know, uh, when U.S. gets its independence by the United States. And up here, essentially, all Indian tribes have been forced to sign over their land and go west. And so almost all Indians are gone east of the Mississippi, except for around this area. And this area is home to these densely populated Mississippi culture groups. Now, again, we talked about these guys from the beginning. Uh, these were the guys that prior to the arrival of Europeans, had built these huge mound cities, cities that are 5,000, sometimes over 10,000 people. 
uh, you know, uh, corn, bean, squash, sedentary agriculturalists, pretty advanced technology. These are the guys that DeSoto had gone through and seen these huge kingdoms. And we talked about how, you know, the Mississippi culture population had been reduced significantly by disease. But then we mentioned how these uh, Mississippi culture groups, in particularly Cherokee Creek, Choctaw, and Chickasaw, um, had adopted or adapted to European ways. They learned English. They learned French when the French were down here. The Spanish. They learned uh, Spanish from uh, the Spanish in Florida, and you know uh, the Spanish rule of Louisiana for a while. And what had happened with these Mississippi culture Indians is they'd used their fairly dense population and their adaptation to Europeans to basically keep uh, uh, Europeans and later Americans at bay. So what they'd done is close contact with these various groups had allowed them to adopt uh, European languages. The Cherokees had even uh, written an, a written alphabet in their native language. Um, they'd started to ad adapt European customs or adopt European customs like uh, living in European style houses, wearing European style clothing, and essentially they were peaceful and they were doing what Europeans did and they were staying on their own land. As a matter of fact, what had happened is they signed these treaties with initially England, France, and, and Britain, but then later on the United States, and they had honored these treaties for the most part, these Cherokees, Choctaws, Creeks, Chickasaws. The treaties basically recognized that they ha had sovereign title to certain lands, and they wouldn't leave these lands. They would rule themselves on these lands, and per the United States part of these treaties, they would keep Americans from going on the Mississippi culture Indians' land. So you have these various Indian groups, sedentary agriculturalists, well adapted to European ways. They'd signed treaties. Now we'd seen there was uh, some creeks that had broken away and, and fought the United States in the War of 1812. But other Mississippi culture groups, including the Cherokees, had fought and helped the United States defeat those creeks. And so we had these Indians honoring their treaties, fighting with the United States, and essentially becoming like Americans. And this is, they're doing exactly what a lot of early presidents wanted. Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, they saw this as the future of the United States. They saw Indians, if they could adapt to uh, American ways, European ways, uh, they would eventually be incorporated into the larger uh, whole of the United States. And they saw what they were doing as sort of uh, the perfect way forward. Now, maybe in a perfect world, uh, you would allow the Indians to keep their culture, things like that. But, you know, the way they're saying it is they have to start adapting. And that's exactly what the Cherokees, Choctaws, Creeks, and Chickasaws had been doing. They'd been signing treaties, honoring, the, honoring their treaties. They hadn't been encroaching on uh, American land, and, uh, and and you'd had this equilibrium that you don't see with other Indian groups. Again, you know uh, what you're going to have with other Indian groups. You know you you would have conflict, and this would lead to extended conflict, which would then lead to the Indian groups moving west. Well, these guys didn't have that conflict because they knew how to deal with um, uh, uh, the Americans. So this is exactly what most Americans want, these Indians adapting to their ways. Well, that's not what Jackson wants. Jackson was, uh, you would call a white supremacist. And this is going to be a lot of Americans, particularly Americans that had grown up on the frontier and maybe had uh, encounters with some of those Indian groups early in their life that would attack Americans. So, Jackson in Tennessee, there'd been some conflict near Jackson. He'd seen Indians killed whites there, not Mississippi culture groups, uh, other groups coming down from uh, the Northwest Territory. Uh, he'd grown to dislike Indians because of that. And during the Creek War, he had fought Creeks who had rebelled against the United States. Again, this is just uh, one, one group within the Mississippi culture. And he saw just because of this one group that Indians were distrustful. And again, um, this is in spite of the fact that he himself had adop adopted a Creek child, in spite of the fact that Cherokees had fought with him against the Creeks. Uh, Jackson distrusted Indians. He believed that, it, that they were incapable of rational thought or incapable of thought uh, on the level of whites. And Jackson just in general believed that whites were 
superior. He um, could envision a biracial society if it was like the one structured in Tennessee where you had whites enslaving blacks and there was a clear superior group, an inferior group. He did not like the prospect of a society where you had two groups on equal ground, which is basically what was happening uh, in this Mississippi culture territory where you had, again, uh, Indians becoming Europeanized and living on their own land but adjacent uh, to whites. This didn't sit well with Andrew Jackson. So Jackson, this when he sees the Southeast and he sees that a significant portion of territory here is controlled by these Indian groups per treaties with the United States, he doesn't like this, okay? Uh, and again, you know, he would point to the fact that, uh, by the way, all this used to be Creek land before uh, Jackson and forces sign over in the uh, War of 1812. But he sees these areas and he says, this is essentially, this is a foreign nation within American soil. I don't like that. I don't trust these guys. Uh, and again, white supremacy, you, you, you add to that. Well, Jackson in uh, 1829, as uh, soon after he's going to enter the presidency, is going to be faced with a situation that could uh, could allow him to flex his beliefs. I don't know if I'm stating that right, but what's going to happen is that gold will be discovered in this Cherokee area down here in Georgia. So Georgia here, this upper portion, is uh, belongs to the Cherokee by a treaty with the United States. Again, the United States said, Cherokees, you stay to your land, which you will, again, uh, because of uh, um, your experiences. You stay to your land, you don't leave your land, and uh, you rule yourselves, and we're going to keep our citizens off your land. Well, things had gone, again, for the most part, good up until 1829, um, but what's going to happen in 1829, when gold is discovered on Cherokee land, you're going to see a lot of whites in Georgia hear about this gold discovery and they're going to start going onto Cherokee land Ill illegally, you know, per treaties with the United States, illegally squatting on Cherokee land and mining uh, uh, this gold on Cherokee territory. Well, maybe if this had been a non-Mississippi culture Indian group and again, Americans and the British and all this before them, we called these guys the civilized tribes, but if this was a non-Mississippi culture group Maybe the Indians would have attacked the squatters, uh, and you know maybe that would have caused conflict. But that's not what the Cherokees do. They understand that um, they understand that if, if you attack somebody, that could lead to conflict, and that'll probably be bad for them. So what the Cherokees instead do is they're going to appeal to the government of Georgia and the United States government. They're going to say, "Hey guys, we signed this treaty. You got some citizens coming up on our land. Hey, we're doing our part." get these guys out of here. Well, the state of Georgia uh, is not going to see things that way. The state of Georgia is filled with, uh, its politicians are similar to Jackson, and they don't like the idea of sending militia to remove uh, American citizens from Georgia territory. And Jackson, when he hears about what's going on up here, he doesn't like the idea of sending American troops to remove Americans from Cherokee territory. Uh, he doesn't feel this is right. And again, you might be able to understand that in that, uh, you know, can a government, you know, illegally remove its citizens by force? But you also got to understand that the United States agreed per treaty to keep its citizens off. So how does Jackson propose to, uh, uh, to solve this? What can Jackson do uh, if he doesn't want to send the federal army to enforce the treaty the United States agreed to? What Jackson is going to do in 1830 is he's going to propose, all right, he's going to say, I can't keep these Americans off this Cherokee land. Uh, but I also don't want the Cherokees killing these Americans who come on, th on their land. So what Jackson is going to propose is that the Indians east of the Mississippi River in these various areas pick up and trade their land here for land in what's today Oklahoma. So uh, Cherokees, you leave your land in North Carolina and Georgia and uh, Creeks, your land in Alabama and Georgia and Chickasaws and Mississippi and uh, Choctaws. You trade this and we'll give you an equal amount of land in Oklahoma. Why'd they pick Oklahoma? Because the way Jackson saw it is that, oh God, I hate, 
I want to do a joke at Oklahoma's expense here. Basically, they say because no nobody would ever want Oklahoma land, so they're not going to be worried about people entering their land. But I, I hate doing it in this instance. But yeah, Oklahoma's the worst. Um, anyway, so um, uh, you guys, you you surrender this land and then you give it to the United States federal government, and we'll provide land over here. Some of this land we'd recently acquired from France uh, as part of the Louisiana Purchase. Nobody had moved into here. And you move out there, uh, and you give up this land. So Jackson will promote propose this basically Indian Removal Act, and essentially this would give the president the power to negotiate these treaties. So he says, instead of removing the uh, Georgians from Cherokee land, we instead tell the Cherokees, accept land over here, give this to the United States. So he doesn't want, um, uh, he wants to handle this matter. Now prior to this, uh, Indian nations had been treated essentially as foreign nations. So if you made a treaty with an Indian tribe, it would go through the Senate. What the Indian Removal Act basically says is, no longer are we going to do that. We're going to let the president handle, handle these uh, Indian treaties. When Jackson proposes this in 1830, there's going to, it basically classifies uh, these Indians no longer as four nations, but as part of the United States and, and allows the president to deal with them. Well, when Jackson proposed this, the Indians are initially going to say, no, we, you, saw, you agreed that we could stay here. You agreed to this. Uh, we want to keep things the way we are. We don't want to trade our land. This is, in a lot of cases, our ancestors have been here for thousand plus years uh, we like it here we don't want to leave so there's going to be opposition from the various Indian groups to what Jackson's saying and actually there's going to be a lot of public opposition to what Jackson's proposing a lot of people say wait a minute these guys uh, these guys have been fulfilling their end of the bargain they haven't been attacking anybody they've been living in peace with us it's our job to honor this. And if we force these guys to leave or if we give them over to Jackson and, and he's going to force them to leave, then essentially this is the United States uh, going against what it promised. Um, this is a cartoon from the time basically showing Jackson, uh, anti-Indian uh, Removal Act thing, showing Jackson locking up the various Indian groups and forcing them west. Uh, and he's riding along with the devil. I don't know what the devil's saying, but it's basically agreeing with what Jackson's doing. And I would say a majority of Americans are going to hear what Jackson's proposing and they're going to object to it. As a matter of fact, a lot of Jackson's own friends uh, are going to come up to him and say, dude, this is messed up. you got to stop this. Uh, Sam Houston, who had served under Andrew Jackson in the War of 1812, uh, he basically goes up to him and says, uh, Sam Houston had spent some time living with the Cherokees. He's going to say, hey, the Cherokees fought with us in the War of 1812. They're good people. Uh, they're not going to harm anybody. Uh, just let them stay on their land. Uh, Jackson dismisses Sam Houston. Davy Crockett also goes up to Jackson like, dude, this is messed up. Let these guys stay where they're going to stay. And you see a lot of opposition, particularly from people in areas that had had, had uh, um, you know, no contact with Indians. And basically they just see it as, uh, as the United States messing up their bargain. Well, Jackson is going to respond to these criticisms by arguing that this is the humane thing to do. He will say that by removing Indians from this area, we're going to remove them from exposure to whites. Um, what's going to happen, and you had actually seen this happen to an extent in Georgia, is that you get these white settlers coming on Indian land. This will eventually lead to conflict. And when Indians uh, attack these white settlers, uh, then whites are going to come in and wipe them out. So I'm saving them from this retaliation. The thing what he's saying is there is an element to truth to that. You know, if, if you do have Indians attack whites, local whites, especially, you know, uh, poor whites uneducated on the frontier, will respond with this overwhelming violence. Now, opponents will come back and say, well, it's the federal government to make responsibility to make sure that doesn't happen. But Jackson's going to really push this Indian removal as a humanitarian uh, necessity argument to Congress to the point where in 1830 this Indian Removal Act uh, will get through Congress barely. Again, this is going to be this bill that most Americans disagree with. Jackson comes up with an argument, um, and, and uh, the members of the Democratic Party will, will follow along with it. And now Jackson, beginning in 1830 as president, is going to set about negotiating treaties to uh, remove these Indians uh, from their land. Um, some of these uh, Indian groups will basically see 
this is uh this is inevitable you know uh there's nothing we can do here let's go ahead and, and just agree to what jackson's proposing and uh let's pick up and 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 just trade our land uh, one of the first groups uh recognizes the, the choctaws they say let's just not fight this let's go out here so if you uh they'll surrender their land here in mississippi they actually go out here to eastern oklahoma which is land that's actually very similar to where they live and they get some pretty quality beautiful land out there but the rest of these Indian groups are going to say, well, no, I don't want to leave my home. Chickasaw and Creek will try to resist this. Um, uh, but eventually both of them are going to realize, uh, I don't know, let's get out of here. Uh, uh, some Creek, by the way, will uh, come down here to Seminole territory. The Seminoles uh, were a Mississippi culture group that sort of broke off and moved down here in Florida. They're also going to be uh, uh, federal agents will come start negotiate with them to leave. Uh, some Seminoles will voluntarily leave and accept land in Oklahoma. Some Seminoles are going to take to the, the swamps of Florida, and they're going to refuse to leave. Um, and, and, and we'll see that later on the United States is going to have this costly wars trying to remove the Seminoles. So some tribes will accept this and trade their land for land in Oklahoma. The Cherokees do not. The Cherokees, now they realize they, they're not going to stand a chance fighting the United States. By this point, uh, U.S. population, I, I have no idea, 300 times out of the Cherokees, four, probably even more than that. Uh, they can't fight uh, the United States, but they can fight them in court. So after learning about the Indian Removal Act, what the Cherokees will do is they're going to uh, appeal this act all the way up to the Supreme Court. Basically, they're going to uh, challenge the legality of it. Um, so first they challenge in Georgia courts. Eventually, um, this uh, Ch uh, Cherokee guy, his name is John Ross, he's going to appeal it up to the Supreme Court. And there the Cherokees will argue that this is unconstitutional because the Constitution basically lays out that the Senate should be in charge of treaties. You're putting the president in charge of it. This isn't his role, uh, so this is unconstitutional. The chief, ju the Supreme Court, and uh, the, the this uh, chief justice of the Supreme Court, a guy named John Marshall, is going to rule in the favor of the Cherokees. And uh, John Marshall, the Supreme Court, is going to come back to Jackson and say, "You don't have the power to do this. This is not uh, something that uh, uh, the president has the power to do." And they're going to agree that the Cherokees should stay on their land. Jackson will then, uh, after hearing this ruling from Justice Marshall, will say, um, Ju Justice Marshall made his ruling, now let's see him try to enforce it. The Supreme Court can make ruling declare something unconstitutional. The Supreme Court doesn't have an army. The Supreme Court can only say something's unconstitutional and assume the other branches are going to listen to it. In this case, Jackson refuses to listen to the Supreme Court's ruling. And instead, what he's going to do is he's going to tell the Cherokees, You've got to leave. You've got to accept this land over here. If you don't, I'm going to send the army down uh, and forcefully remove you. Um, the Cherokees at this point, a handful will actually take to the mountains of North Carolina, um, uh, t take the mountains of uh, North Carolina and hide out. And that's why today there's a small uh, Cherokee reservation here. Uh, just like down here, some Seminoles will take to the Everglades and hide out. But most Cherokees are going to be here in 1835 uh, when the U.S. Army shows up and says, You've got to leave, leave your land. The president ordered you to get out of here. And the Cherokees are going to be forced to make this trail of tears where the U.S. Army uh, marches them uh, overland uh, into uh, this Cherokee land. And by the way, the Cherokees, because of their last holdouts, they don't get they get some pretty poor land in Oklahoma um, uh, for trying to fight this. Again, they successfully fought it. It's just that Jackson refused to to uh, agree to the Supreme Court ruling and went be beyond what the president uh, is supposed to uh, do. Okay, all right. So uh, essentially, what happens here with this Indian Removal Act is that almost all Indians east of the Mississippi, again, excepting a handful of Seminoles that hide out, a handful of Cherokees, and a handful of smaller Indian tribes that have either assimilated uh, with Americans or, uh, you know, are just basically in the, in the countryside. It, it, let me just put it this way. This is basically end of Indians east of the Mississippi. Uh, and this, this uh, Indian Removal Act, this is one of these uh, pockmarks in American history. Again, with other conflict with Indians, there's nuance. Uh, there's not really a lot of nuance here. It's the United States uh, forcing Indians off their land. 
All right, uh, and this would be a depiction of the, the Trail of Tears. Uh, um, people claim, uh, and I'm not sure of the exact numbers, but it's uh, some people say that a quarter of the Cherokee Nation uh, died uh, because there was poor conditions uh, when the U.S. Army forced them to move west on that Trail of Tears. All right, so this is uh, Jackson. Um, this is Jackson uh, taking on this new role, operating with personal biases. Another uh, way you're going to see this in Jackson's presidency is in his interactions with his vice president, uh, John C. Calhoun. Uh, so John C. Calhoun, again, had been vice president under John Quincy Adams. He defected the Democratic Party, and he had run with Jackson in 1828, and he'd uh, been elected with Jackson. And now he's sitting his second term as vice president, but now under an entirely new uh, president. And again, when Jackson enters the presidency, he's very thankful to John C. Calhoun. Uh, John C. Calhoun from South Carolina uh, brought some votes from there, and these guys are um, uh, best of buddies, you know. And John C. Calhoun is basically seeing himself as the successor to Andrew Jackson. Martin Van Buren's over here. He sees himself as a successor, successor as well. John C. Calhoun, as Jackson's VP, also sees him as, eventually, I'm going to take over for Jackson. So Calhoun is uh, friendly with Jackson. All right, well, things are going to begin to happen that will see this rivalry start breaking apart. One thing that's going to happen is a, kind of a minor issue. In, uh, in, in 1818, when Jackson was in the Army, he had been placed on the Florida, uh, Florida and Georgia border, and he'd been in charge of preventing slaves from running away from Georgia into what was then Spanish Florida and preventing uh, Seminoles from raiding from Florida into Georgia and Alabama. And uh, as we had talked about in the past, Jackson had taken it upon himself to invade Spanish Florida without authorization from the national government. Well, at the time this had happened, John C. Calhoun was Secretary of War, and he heard what Jackson did, and he basically had talked smack about Jackson. You know, this general, he's not listening to my commands, he's reckless, and he had he had called on Jackson to be fired. He talked to the president, we can't ha just have this guy disobeying orders. All right, well, John C. Calhoun had talked smack about Jackson, uh, again, this was uh, uh, when he was James Monroe's Secretary of uh, War. Well, Jackson hadn't heard about it, just been in private conversation. Well, Jackson, word will reach him, you know, uh, in 1830, that, hey, Calhoun had talked smack about you for invading Spanish Florida. Well, Jackson, you know, he's kind of upset about that. Not a big deal, but he's basically going to hear about it, and word will get back to Calhoun that Jackson heard what you said. Well, as an apology, uh, Calhoun will write a 55-page letter that just says, Sorry, Jackson. Sorry I talked smack about you. You know, I didn't like you invading Spain and Florida, but you're so cool. Um, you know, it's just a misunderstanding. And uh, um, please keep inviting me to, to the cabinet meetings. And I love you. Let's, let's remain besties. Well, Jackson will... Ah, Calhoun, it's fine. You know, I understand you, you talked out of turn or whatever, but uh, as long as you admit you're wrong, then uh, then then that's fine. So minor issue. Not, not anything big. And again, this is before the guys really even personally knew each other. Well, something else is going to happen in 1830, and this is going to be something that Jackson will take to heart. All right? What's going to happen in 1830 is that Jackson is going to learn that Calhoun had anonymously authored something called the South Carolina Exposition and Protest. Okay? All right. So, so shortly before Jackson and Calhoun had been elected, um, John Quincy Adams had signed into law uh, a new tariff increasing the duties on income and incoming manufactured goods. Again, Southerners don't like this because they just want the cheapest goods coming in. They're not doing any, any manufacturing themselves, so it doesn't help uh, them any if you encourage manufacturing in the United States because they're not doing manufacturing. They just want to get the cheapest goods. They don't care if they're coming from Britain or the United States. So this bill had been passed in 1828, um, and people in South Carolina are going to be upset about it including John C. Calhoun. And by the way, John C. Calhoun had approved an increase in the tariff shortly after the War of 1812 because he thought it would reduce American dependencies on British goods. 
but he and a lot of Southerners had changed their mind by that point. So when this tariff is passed, the people of South Carolina are going to go to John C. Calhoun, and they're going to say, well, what are we going to do about this? Uh, and this is right before the election of 1828 when he and Jackson take office. Uh, and John C. Calhoun is going to say, don't, don't worry about it. When me and Jackson take over, we'll probably get rid of the tariff. Well, the people of South Carolina are going to point to the fact, well, Jackson, he's not saying anything about the tariff. He's just saying judicious tariff. He's not saying anything. What if he gets in and he supports the tariff? Well, John C. Calhoun is going to come back and he will say, all right, if Jackson doesn't support the tariff, I've got an idea. And so shortly after they do get elected in 1828, uh, John C. Calhoun will author something called the South Carolina Exposition and Protest, and he does this anonymously, uh, and he's going to introduce this anonymously to the South Carolina legislature. And what the South Carolina Exposition and Protest will do is it's going to call the tariff unconstitutional. Basically, the tariff, uh, the national government can't impose a tariff on incoming manufacturers to promote manufacturing. That's unconstitutional. Well, first, that's ridiculous. One of the few things that are pointed out specifically in the Constitution is that the, the national government can regulate interstate trade. So, of course, they can increase the duty on, on incoming goods. That argument's dumb. But uh, John C. Calhoun, South Carolina, he's doing it to appease these people in South Carolina that are upset. Uh, and so he's saying that. Another thing that John C. Calhoun will say in a South Carolina exposition and protest is he's going to reiterate that idea that Jefferson and Madison had put forth in the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions. So you remember way back when, when um, uh, in, as a result of the Sedition Act, uh, Jefferson and Madison had uh, done their Virginia and Kentucky resolution. They would proposed the idea that states could nullify or not listen to laws they deemed unconstitutional. They'd argued that states are determiners of constitutionality in addition to the Supreme Court and the president. Now, they'd later on, you know, gone against that idea, but at the time they were upset about the Sedition Act and they wanted the ability for states to say, we don't want to listen to that. Well, what Calhoun will do in his anonymous South Carolina exposition and protest is he's going to say they were right. So if we get elected and Jackson decides not to get rid of the tariff, then um, what, what you can do, South Carolina, is you can nullify it. All right, You can just go ahead and nullify it, not listen to it. So he puts that forth in uh, this exposition and protest. Again, they're already elected. He's doing this without consulting Jackson. He's doing this anonymously. Well, the final thing he's going to do in the South Carolina exposition and protest is he will say, if Jackson chooses not to um, recognize that we can nullify laws, South Carolina has the ability to secede from the Union because states made a compact to form the Union, which means not only can they nullify laws they deem unconstitutional, but they can choose to leave if they want. So he goes further than Jefferson and Madison and gone in the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions, and what he's going to say is, South Carolina, it'll be okay, we can leave if... Um, if, if Jackson refuses to uh, uh, listen to our nullification. So, again, what he's saying is, well, probably Jackson will get rid of the tariff, um, but if he doesn't, then we'll nullify it. And if Jackson says, well, you can't nullify it, we'll just go ahead and leave the Union. We have that ability to do that. He introduces this to the South Carolina legislature. The South Carolina legislature approves it. Now, it's not doing anything. It's just saying what the South Carolina legislature believes. Well, this had been secret, and, you know, word had gotten around that South Carolina passed this bill, and Jackson's going to approach John C. Calhoun and say, can you believe what your home state's doing? What are these guys talking about? They can leave my union. They don't have to listen to my laws. And Jackson's going to grow upset about the South Carolina exposition and protest not because he cares about the tariff, but because South Carolina is saying they don't have to listen to laws from the United States, which Jackson now runs. So he grows upset, and he sees the South Carolina exposition and protest as an attack on his presidential power. Well, while he's saying this in 1829, uh, after learning about it, John C. Calhoun's sort of sitting there like, oh, crap, you know, I can't believe they said that. What a bunch of jerks. He's basically... Uh, um, when, when in reality he knows uh, uh, he's the one that authored it. But things are going okay until 1830 when Jackson learns 
that John C. Calhoun was in fact the one who authored the South Carolina Exposition and Protest. Again, Jackson, he didn't even really, this isn't something that uh, he, he cares about the tariff. That's not the issue here. It's that John C. Calhoun said this after they'd become friends, and then he had said it uh, basically saying that South Carolina's state doesn't have to listen to his power. So he hears about this, and at the, after this point, he's going to start looking unfriendly on John C. Calhoun, start inviting him to less and less meetings, and there's going to be this sort of unspoken rivalry that will begin with these two. Uh, and as a matter of fact, after learning about uh, his authorship, um, we'll see Jackson start moving towards Martin Van Buren as his chosen successor instead of John C. Calhoun. Um, and so uh, um, you, you start seeing this uh, breaking up of this Jackson and his, vi uh, his alliance with the vice president. Um, not only that, but supposedly... Uh, after learning about this, there's a dinner at the White House for Thomas Jefferson's birthday. At this point, the two are growing distrustful of one another, but they're still, you know, somewhat somewhat friends. Uh, but supposedly at this dinner, Jackson gets up and makes a speech, and saying, pointing directly to Calhoun, he says he gives a toast and he says, "Our federal union it must be preserved." And what he's saying there is. Hey, you dummy, you're talking about this, uh, you can leave the union when, it, when you want. That idea is ridiculous. Nobody's leaving my union. Well, Calhoun supposedly gets up, gets his glass, and as people are describing it, you know, later on, they say his hand's shaking. He says to Jackson, the union next to our liberties, the most dear. So, yeah, this union's great, but if it impedes on our liberties, uh, you know, then we can leave. So these guys start to have this uncomfortable relationship. Well, things are going to get even worse uh, when this incident called the Peggy Eaton Affair starts to take over the White House. Now, this is one of those things that's somewhat embarrassing to teach about because it's basically a soap opera that's going to affect American politics. Uh, but what's going to begin to happen is shortly after taking over the presidency, um, uh, Andrew Jackson will start to notice that the other wives of his cabinet members and of his close advisors aren't hanging out with his buddy, his Secretary of War, John Eaton's wife, Peggy Eaton. Why is this? Well, as the story goes, John Eaton had only recently met Peggy Eaton. He had basically moved to Washington shortly after taking over Secretary of War, and before he'd bought a house or anything like that, he started t staying at a boarding house. Um, again, basically a hotel. And we're going to see some similarities with uh, Jackson and his wife because basically John Eaton, uh, while he's staying at this boarding house, he's going to meet the daughter of the boarding house owner, uh, this this woman uh, named uh, uh, Peggy. Um, her last name at the point this point is Peggy Timberlake, I believe is her, is her is her full name. It's not Eaton just yet. Well, John Eaton and Peggy will start hanging out, and they're going to start openly having a courtship. Okay, uh, start having PDA kissing in public, this type of thing. Well, this is isn't problematic for John Eaton because he's single uh, when he comes here to Washington. Peggy is not. Peggy is married, and her husband is in the Navy. So her husband is essentially going to be an employee of John Eaton because John Eaton is the Secretary of War, and now um, his wife is, is running around with the Secretary of War in Washington, and they're not being very discreet about it. Well, shortly after this affair begins, you know, the talk on uh, all, all around Washington, uh, we don't know if Peggy Eaton's or uh, Peggy Timberlake's husband knows about it because he's out to sea at the time. He's out, out to sea. He's on a naval ship. I don't know where they're at. They're, they're out there doing naval ship stuff. But Peggy Eaton's husband will kill himself while he's out to sea. Well, after this happens, a lot of people will sort of recommend John Eaton. Okay, well, now you guys can get married. It's, you know, you... you uh, but you probably shouldn't be public about your relationship for a while because you don't want to make it would make Peggy look bad if her husband just died and she's cavorting around town. Well, John Eaton, Peggy Eaton, don't take that advice. They continue to have their uh, very public affair. And then only four months after her husband kills herself, Peggy Eaton will marry John Eaton. 
So this woman that was married and having this open affair with Jackson's buddy, John Eaton, is now going to be brought to cabinet meetings. And at these cabinet meetings at various parties, uh, she'll be introduced to Secretary of Treasury's wife, uh, you know, um, initially John C. Calhoun's wife, Florida Calhoun or Floride Calhoun. Uh, And she's going to be introduced to all these wives. But the wives of the other cabinet members, and again, Jackson doesn't have a wife. His his wife passed away before uh, taking the presidency. All of these women turn their nose up at Peggy. And in particular, Floride Calhoun will basically say, she's a hussy. We don't want to associate with her. This woman had been sleeping around uh, on her previous husband. She didn't wait a long, a long enough after her husband died to start having this affair. And so they won't associate with Peggy Eaton at, um, at White House social functions. As a matter of fact, the only people talking with Peggy Eaton are her husband, John Eaton, and Martin Van Buren. Martin Van Buren's wife had died, so she's not among the sort of cabal of wives that hate Peggy Eaton. So Martin Van Buren would talk Peggy Eaton up. So Andrew Jackson will see this treatment of Peggy Eaton, and he's going to grow mad. Why would he be mad at this? Well, the way, what he sees is Peggy Eaton being treated like his wife had been treated uh, during the uh, 1828 election. So Jackson is going to grow furious, and he's basically going to call his cabinet members and say, you guys need to tell your wives to treat this woman with respect. Well, telling your wives to do that, that's not going to accomplish anything. They're probably not going to listen to you. And so at these White House meetings, there's going to be con- this continued conflict between Peggy Eaton and the wives of his other cabinet members. And in the midst of this, you're going to see this growing divide with Calhoun over the exposition and protest. Uh, and so what starts to happen is basically you start seeing these divisions. You see Martin Van Buren, Buren John, John Eaton on one side, and you're going to see these guys sort of defecting to Calhoun's camp because they, uh, uh, again, you know, because of the growing divide with Jackson. Jackson is going to get so upset by this, he wants to fire all the cabinet members that are refusing to associate with Peggy. And he's so upset, it reminds him of his, uh, his uh, situation with his wife. And he's going to actually talk to Martin Van Buren and John Eaton about this. And he's going to say, guys, what should I do here? I want to keep you, but I'm planning to fire the rest of you guys. Well, this is kind of controversial because there's, it's unclear per the Constitution if presidents can even fire cabinet members. But Martin Van Buren is going to say to um, uh, Andrew Jackson, don't, don't fire everybody but us, okay? First of all, you can't fire John C. Calhoun because he's the vice president. That's an elected position. But if you fire everyone else, the public's going to look at this and basically say, this is he's doing this over this drama, this political affair. This would be a cartoon from the time, the fighting in, in Jackson's kitchen cabinet. Uh, or it's going to be seen as, you know, uh, this drama that's coming out of this Peggy Eaton affair. Or it's going to be seen as a divide between you and John C. Calhoun. And this wouldn't look good to the public. So what uh, Martin Van Buren is going to, to suggest is that Andrew Jackson go to his cabinet in 1831 and ask for all of their reg- resignation, including that of Martin Van Buren and John Eaton. Just get rid of all of us, okay? That way it just looks to the public like you're clearing house to make things more efficient. It's not because there's a divide in the cabinet, and it's certainly not because of Peggy Eaton, because, look, you're firing John Eaton, and you're firing me as well. So in 1831, Jackson will fire his entire cabinet, uh, including Martin Van Buren and John Eaton everybody's gone and he's going to end up replacing them uh with uh, uh with, with a completely different group and a group that's entirely loyal to Jackson. So this Peggy Eaton affair is going to further divide um uh Jackson and, and John C Calhoun. All right, so Jackson does this uh and shortly after he does this, Martin Van Buren's not out, out of a job. This is kind of an interesting side note. Um, Jackson fires his entire cabinet, including Martin Van Buren. Jackson, he says to Martin Van Buren, I'm going to fire you, but because I trust you so much, I'm going to make you VP in 1832 when I run again because I'm go- not going to be running again with John C. Calhoun. So basically Jackson completely cuts ties with John C. Calhoun. Uh, when he Again, he can't officially get rid of him as VP because it's an elected position, but Jackson's going to say when I run again in 1832, uh, Martin Van Buren, you're going to be my VP candidate. This guy's gone. And so he makes that clear to John C. Calhoun. Uh, but to sort of 
provide Martin Van Buren with um, a job until 1832 when he can appoint him as his VP candidate. What Jackson's going to do is he's going to appoint Martin Van Buren to be ambassador to England. Um, ambassadors have to get Senate approval before they can take their position. Well, the Senate um, takes a vote, and if you get a majority vote, an ambassador's improve, approved. Well, Martin Van Buren gets to the Senate, and the Senate's actually split 50-50. Uh, it's not 50-50. I think it would be uh, tw whatever, 26-26, something like that. Uh, but uh, uh, w when he goes up, um, it's split. And if you have a tie in the Senate, the vote goes to the VP. This is one of the only jobs that the vice president has is breaking a tie. Uh, John C. Calhoun will vote to deny uh, Martin Van Buren ambassadorship to England. So that shows how broken apart these two guys are by 1832. All right. Well, uh, what we'll see again in 1832 is um, uh, Jackson will decide not to run uh, with John C. Calhoun, and he is going to appoint uh, Martin Van Buren as his candidate for the vice presidency. Again, obviously, uh, uh, Jackson is, is going to be running for the president, but again, now we're going to have Martin Van Buren as my VP. Um, well, in the midst of this, we're going to see yet another controversy arise with John C. Calhoun, and this is going to... Um, come out of something that will be passed by Jackson in uh, just shortly before the 1832 election. So before the, shortly before the 1832 election, Henry Clay is going to be running against Andrew Jackson as a Republican Party candidate. You don't need to know a whole heck of a lot about this election because poor Henry Clay is going to lose this thing. But Henry Clay will be running against Jackson, and one of the things he wants to do to Jackson is to force him to make a decision on the tariff. He doesn't want Jackson to be able to do what he did in 1828 and sort of skirt around the tariff issue. So in 1832, Henry Clay will pass a bill through Congress that's going to call for an increase in the tariff. Clay's for this. John C. Calhoun is against it because his home state of South Carolina doesn't like the tariff. Henry Clay likes it because it's part of his American system, high tariff, national bank, uh, and, and internal improvements. Well, the bill's going to get up to Andrew Jackson's desk, and he's going to look at it, and he basically sees that this is something that Henry Clay likes, which I would normally veto, but this is also something that John C. Calhoun hates. So Henry Clay likes it. I hate Henry Clay. John C. Calhoun hates it. I hate John C. Calhoun now. And I'm telling you, maybe you'll think Jackson actually thinks about this for political reasons. I genuinely believe he looks at this and he looks and says, do I hate Henry Clay more right now or do I hate John C. Calhoun more uh, because now we're rivals? And I swear, he's just going to determine that at this point he hates Henry Clay more and he's going to veto uh, or he's going to approve, I'm sorry, approve this increased tariff. So we'll see him do this shortly before the election. And again, Henry Clay had done this to basically uh, force Jackson to take a position on the tariff, hoping that he would get to that Jackson would lose enough votes for Henry Clay to win the 32 election. Um, it's not going to happen. Uh, Henry Clay basically uh, isn't going to get enough votes. South Carolina runs their own candidate because they don't like Henry Clay because he likes the tariff. They also don't like Jackson because they approved the tariff. Um, I don't know what the, what's going on with that word guy, but uh, Henry Clay doesn't win 32, so Jackson's set to take over a, a second term beginning in 1833. Well, South Carolina is going to look at this, and now they've got four more years of Jackson, and now they're no longer going to even have John C. Calhoun as his VP because, again, John C. Calhoun, now you got to leave office because you're no longer buddies with uh, uh, Jackson and he had uh, run, run with Martin Van Buren. So how should we deal with this? What should we do here? We've got this new tariff that's just been passed, and we've got four more years at Jackson. Well, South Carolina, after the 1832 election, is going to decide to hold a state convention and what this state convention will do is to discuss what to do about the new tariff. Well, what the state convention of South Carolina will decide is to employ the ideas put forth, or at least some of the ideas put forth by John C. Calhoun in his exposition and protest. 
The state convention meets. It's a bunch of uh, elites from South Carolina. They're going to meet, and they're going to determine, all right, we don't have anybody in power that's going to listen to us, so we're choosing to not listen to the tariff. We're not going to pay uh, duties that come into South Carolina. We're basically going to uh, prevent the duty collectors at these end of these docks from collecting the duties on incoming manufactured goods. We don't like it. Again, we're not manufacturing. We're not making money off of this. Uh, you know, we just want the cheapest goods coming in from wherever. And so they're going to determine to uh, nullify it. And they're going to announce that they're not going to listen to this uh, new tariff. Now, Jackson will hear about this uh, nullification uh, announcement. How do you think he's going to respond to it? Okay, again, he doesn't really care any, anything about the tariff. You know, sure, whatever, good for manufacturing. Sure, I understand people don't like it. But the fact that South Carolina says they're not going to listen to a law that he just approved of is just going to drive uh, Andrew Jackson completely nuts. And what's going to make him even crazier is that he learns that John C. Calhoun had actually traveled to South Carolina, and by the way, he's still VP until uh, March 1833, uh, so he had actually traveled to South Carolina, and he had joined the nullifiers in calling for nullification. And not only that, but John C. Calhoun is going to advocate and that these South Carolina nullifiers are going to say that if the federal government doesn't listen to that, listen to us, and let us not listen to this law, then we're just going to go ahead and leave the union. So Andrew Jackson is basically having South Carolina say they're not going to listen to one of his laws. Well, why, first of all, before we go on further with that, why is South Carolina doing this? Well, what they're hoping is that uh, if they nullify it, other southern states that don't like paying the tariff will start joining them and basically saying, all right, we're going to nullify it too here in Georgia. We're also going to nullify it in Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana. And eventually so many states would uh, uh, get on board with South Carolina that what, what you're going to see is uh, the federal government saying, ah, we're, we're not going to enact this thing. Instead, what happens is they're just going to royally piss Andrew Jackson off. Uh, he's going to say, uh, Calhoun's behind this. I'm going to go down there. And he threatens to hang Calhoun from a tree. And he's going to say, I'm going to kill these nullifiers, essentially. And he's going to bring a bill before Congress asking if he can use force to go down there, arrest those uh, members of the state convention, and end this nullification crisis through force. So he introduces a bill asking the U.S. The US Army to crush the nullifiers. Now, he wasn't willing to use the U.S. Army to uh, uh, fight Americans entering Cherokee territory, but he is willing to use it to crush nullifiers because, again, this is in opposition to him, and he doesn't like to be uh, opposed. So he asked for this force, uh, permission to use force. Congress almost passes it. It barely, barely passes. And it's only going to miss by a couple votes. But Jackson, he's won a couple seats in Congress. Basically, he realizes, all right, well, I'll get the votes when new Congress takes over in March 1833. Um, so I'll just use force then. And then we're going to go down there and we're going to just destroy South Carolina uh, for daring to oppose me and daring to threaten secession. Now, if this was a science class, uh, it'd be interesting because uh, what if Jackson does go down there, crush these guys? You know, some people say maybe that would have prevented the Civil War, you know, if you had a president saying no talk about secession, anything like that. Of course, it could have led other states to support South Carolina. You might have even seen the Civil War earlier. I don't know what had happened, but that's it's not going to get to that point because uh, what's going to happen at the beginning of 1833 is Henry Clay is going to knock on the door of John C. Calhoun Henry Clay, who has nothing in common with John C. Calhoun. Again, Henry Clay is for the tariff, which John C. Calhoun hates. He's talking about internal improvements to the national government. He's talking about National Bank, which is another thing that John C. Calhoun no longer approves of. So these guys have nothing in common, but Henry Clay is going to go to John C. Calhoun and he's going to say, dude, I've got an idea here. Um, why don't I put a new bill before Congress we're not going to completely get rid of the tariff. Again, I love the tariff. But what we're going to do is we're going to reduce the tariff over the coming years. So it's up here now. We'll go ahead and this new bill, reduce the tariff uh, to where it goes down a couple percentage points every couple years to a level that's tolerable to South Carolina. So we're not getting rid of it entirely, 
but I want to work together with you on this thing. Well, John C. Calhoun probably, went, before Henry Clay showed up, was shaking in his boots, thinking Andrew Jackson's coming down to him. He would love if there was no tariff at all, but John C. Cl or I'm sorry, Henry Clay's basically offering him an out. So when Henry Clay makes this proposal, John C. Calhoun is going to go to the secessionists or the nullifiers in South Carolina, and he's going to say, "Can we step down? Um, uh, can we step down from our our nullification? It, you know, if we we approve this, they'll agree to it, and South Carolina will end its threats of nullification, uh, agreeing that Henry Clay uh, will." pass this new bill gradually reducing the tariff. Now again this is kind of interesting because uh, what would have happened if, if uh, uh, Andrew Jackson had marched down we don't know but it's not going to happen because Clay and Calhoun reach this agreement. So we know why Calhoun agrees to this because if it didn't he probably would have died. Jackson would have come, uh, come down there and killed him. But why would Henry Clay bail out John C. Calhoun and why would he reduce the tariff when this is something that he truly believes in. Well, Henry Clay does this because he's forming a coalition that basically its whole platform is we've got to put aside personal differences, political differences. We got to do everything we can to get Jackson out of office. <laughs>